Yeah, again, it's thrilling to see how relevant the scripture is to where we stand now. And to know how God, how good God is, to know what we anticipate, the good things that lie ahead for us. Oh, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Bless you all today. Let uh, all good things happen to you. Uh, I don't know how long the Lord's going to allow us to enjoy the blessings we enjoy here. If he's going to take us first, if he's going to let us taste of some of what some of the saints in the past, so many of the saints in the past have experienced, we may, but we were talking about this a little earlier. Uh, there just seems to be a, a theme verse that comes to me powerfully. Uh, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. My, my. I, I mentioned, if you'll pardon this personal comment, if they come to the door of my house and they want to take all my guns away from me, I'm not going to shoot somebody for that. Good grief. Uh, take me away. I am what you say I am. Take me away. Guilty. What is that old story if? A lot of saints were brought into court for being a Christian. Would there be enough evidence to convict them? That's, all right, let, let's get with it. I'm sorry. Bless the Lord. Some of us uh, took note of the fact that there is uh, no explanation in the Scripture of the events which take place at the end of, of uh, chapter uh, three of Revelation and the opening of chapter four. You come into the throne room. You've the voice of the Lord has come up here. Rise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Uh, the the believers are suddenly seen uh, in a in a figure on twenty four thrones, wearing white robes, uh, which are the righteousness of the saints, wearing golden. Uh, diadems, which are the rewards that are given to the saints. But those very important events that take place between rise up my love and seated on 24 thrones, again, the figure of the whole body of Christ, uh, we talked about, I think we did in the past, I hope we did it anyway. <coughs> But there's some very important events that take place. Now, you think about what we've already looked at in this book of Revelation in chapter 1. Chapter 1 is a grand uh, chapter. The first three uh, verses address the blessing that's pronounced upon those who read, hear, and keep the prophecy of this book. That idea of the word keep is hold dear. Um the uh, uh, rich young ruler, you remember, uh, uh, Jesus asked him, I'm sorry, um, keep the commandments. You know what they are? He listed, Jesus listed uh, seven, uh, I'm sorry, nine of the twelve. Nine. Seven of the ten. I got so many numbers going through my head, I'm so sorry. Anyhow, all these have I kept. What, the, what he was saying was, I held them dear. He didn't flawlessly obey all of them, but he held them dear. That's what uh, the Revelation is pronouncing, a blessing on those who read here and hold dear. The promises of this book, and of course at the end, there's a pronounced a curse against those who take away from it. Uh, verses 4 through 8, he addresses the message that he has, but in 9 through 12, it's his commission, John's commission. And, and the revelation that Jesus Christ gave to him to give to his churches things which must shortly 
come to fast. Now the idea of that is once they get started, they're really going to roll. And you know, of course, the prophecies which are identified in Revelation as well of Daniel's 70th week. We won't get to that yet. So there are some very important events that take place between the come up here and the 24 elders seated in the heavenlies. Now, these take place in the heavenlies, but they precede those events. And the most critical one is, of course, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ has already taken place when the 24 elders are seated. The seated they are seated already rewarded. So how do they get that reward? What takes place to get that reward? Now, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you might have picked up on this, that that's excluded from this explanation, but I'm going to take you to some verses. I'm going to read these. Uh, I got those out, didn't I? Yes. Uh, sometimes it helps, sometimes it don't. I'm looking to, at uh, 2 Corinthians, please, and chapter 5. If you want to follow with me in this very important chapter in with re reference to these events. One and following, for we know, oh, it's good to know this. Believers know. You know that? They, they know. Oh, well. For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle or tent is destroyed. This body that we're living in, this earthly tabernacle, it's temporary. Tabernacles are temporary. If we know it is destroyed, we have a building from God, a building from a God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's that new body what that's promised to you. have that in Philippians 3, of course. For in this we groaned earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our house, habitation, which is from heaven. I'm reading from the New King James. I think you're getting the King James, but don't let me confuse you with what I'm reading. So we're looking forward to that body, that new body, which is from heaven. Verse 3, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, what does it mean by naked? The spirits of just men made perfect. All those believers that uh, ascended with the Lord Jesus, their bodies didn't. And they are therefore naked in the heavenlies. They're waiting for that body uh, which comes with the resurrection of the righteous when uh, uh, the, the whole body is translated. Now, the body of Christ is already experiencing that blessing of the resurrection. That's what takes place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But there's a whole other body of people who, while they're in paradise... Their bodies are still uh, in the earth. I'm trying to get this out so I don't mess it up like I did a couple of weeks ago. I try to talk faster than I'm thinking. I, think, I can't think that fast. So understand that when 1 Thessalonians 4, the trump of God, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain are caught up together to meet the Lord. That's the church. And the church is unique. And the church has been translated. But there's a whole lot of other believers that are going to be translated that are not yet redeemed and their bodies are still in the earth they're uh, to be absent from the bodies to be present with the lord and a believer when he dies i don't care what part of the redeemed he belongs to he goes to the glory am i getting this clear 
In this dispensation in which we live presently, we're looking at the church. But there are other dispensations, if you would, that are yet to come. A lot of believers, and they're not in the church. The church is completed when the last individual is born again into the body of Christ and the church is translated. After that, you will have tribulation saints. You'll even have millennial saints. That's a different body of believers. I'm going to say this again. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, many abiding places, many dwellings. And I go to prepare a place for you. That's unique. That's the church. So there's, there's one for Israel. There's one for uh, redeemed Gentiles. There's one for redeemed babies. There's just all kinds of categories of abiding places that are in the heavenlies. I probably brought up something with that one comment, but I'll let that go now. So let me get on with the text. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 4, for we are in this, uh, we who are in this tent, tabernacle, groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality might be swallowed up in life. This dead body received life. That's what uh, the saints anticipate. In the, in the translation of the church. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given unto us the guarantee of the Spirit. Now, if you have the Spirit of God, uh, you can't be left. I mean, God's not going to leave your, you, uh, the Spirit in you if he uh, takes you to the glory. He isn't going to separate the Holy Spirit. So it's a guarantee that you're going to go. So we are always confident, knowing rather, that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. you believe that? Yes. yes. Amen. you believe that? We are confident well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. Believers want to walk with God. They fall flat on their face, but they want to walk with God. Now, verse 10. This is the one I'm really after. <clears throat> Pardon me, for <clears throat> we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That word judgment is bema seat. Uh, now, I've tried to express this illustration before. Allow me again. Those of you who have watched the film Ben Hur, you'll remember when Yehuda Ben Hur comes up uh, to the governor before, uh, after the uh, chariot. chariot race, he places that laurel wreath of victory upon his head, that was the Bema seat, the judgment seat. And every believer is going to come before the Bema seat of Christ. The Father judges no man. He's committed all judgment into the hands of the Son. So where judgment is taking place, the Son is doing it. That even goes to the great white throne. That's another subject. So... We must all appear before the bema seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body. Now, that's not that body you're sitting there in. That's the body of Christ, the body, the body of Christ. That's Paul's term for the church. According to what he has done, whether it be good or bad, allow me a lamb translation, useful or useless. Now, in order to go on with this, we have to take a, a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and see how this takes place. 
And by the way, I wanted to say this when I started, and I didn't. I'm going to say it right now. If somebody says, Keith, I don't understand what word you're saying, I want you to shoot up your hand and say, Stop, Keith, and explain on me what you just said. Please do that. Okay. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, this is the judgment seat of Christ described. So when you got to the second epistle, these Corinthian believers have already read this. So when he says we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, they know from the previous epistle this is what's going to take place. Okay, uh, well, just for time's sake, verse 11, if you'll allow. Maybe verse 9, all right. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, uh, architect is the word, he designed the thing. Uh, uh, God gave him the plan, and he had the responsibility of giving the architectural plan of the church to the church. I have laid the foundation, but another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. And remember, he said that same thing to Moses. He showed him the true tabernacle in the heavenlies, and he said to Moses, Take heed that you make it according to the pattern that you saw in the mount. So Paul gives us this record so we know how the church is supposed to look. And of course, Ephesians chapter 1 is the grand foundational pattern for that. On we go. Finally, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, straw, if you would, each one's work will be clear for the day will declare it. Now, what day? The day of Christ. You have the day of man, we'll get that, the day of man, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God. Those are the four major days in Scripture. Now, under the day of the Lord, there are other days. Under the day of God, there uh, are other days. And, but those are the primary headings of God's dealings with man, the day of man, they have Christ, they have the Lord, they have God. All right, so Paul said, uh, the day, the day of Christ, is going to declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, <clears throat> pardon me, I haven't been there yet. So I don't know how in practical terms we're going to face that fire, but we are going to go through a consuming fire. And the only thing it'll consume is what is useless. And what is useful will go into paradise, the glory of God, presence of the glory of God. So... Uh, Think about the three Hebrews. Uh, to me, they're the best illustration. Uh, prophetically, it's talking about Israel and the three parts of redeemed Israel. But they're put in that fiery furnace. And it was heated seven times greater than it was wont to be heated, the scripture said. It's pretty hot because those guys that threw them in there, you remember? They got consumed by the fire. Wow. You understand how those, let me say this just for historical academics. Those furnaces, we look at it as something you look straight into here, and it's a great big furnace, and they went in the, uh, -uh. It was a long tube, 
and it created a draft with, and it could create severe heat so that they could smelt things, metals. And there was a hole in the top and they were dropped in from the top and the fire was belching out of that hole in the top when these guys threw them in and so it consumed them and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if it had been Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'd have died in the fire. But they were really Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and therefore they survived the fire. One day what the world looks at you as, but one the other is what God looks at you as. That's why you all have a new name. Yeah. Another, another subject. Uh, the fire so, is going to purge us of what is useless. Well, we'll wait to see how that takes place, but it's obviously going to be a good thing because I want to get rid of all that stuff. I can't imagine. You know, just uh, I'm jumping ahead if I'm not careful here. Okay, so uh, uh, verse 14. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures... He will receive a reward. If it gets through the fire, get a reward for it. If anyone's work is burned, now watch this, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. In other words, he gets, let me borrow Job's term again, he gets through by the skin of his teeth, and all that trash that he produced is lost, but he himself, is saved because he's a child of God. He belongs to the Lord. Can't be otherwise. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple we are. Now, he goes on in these next verses to uh, address the issue of who judges. But I'm going to skip, if I may, and hold it at verse 11. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 14. Now, this last phrase in verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. We've talked about so many times in the past, I get embarrassed at bringing up issues that I know you know all about. But for the sake of the record, I guess I can put it that way. Remember that reward is obtained by, I know you know you're just afraid to answer, faithfulness is required of a steward that a man be found successful. No, that a man be found faithful, just keeping at it. You know, I think of this, if I digress these, Missionaries, they're working in Muslim countries. And, and they see, you know, in the course of their lifetime, one, two, three, twelve, a dozen maybe converts. But they stayed at it. They, they were blooming where they were planted. Just keep at it. Whatever God's given you to do, Paul says this in another place, Whatever God's given you to do, do it heartily from the soul, literally that reads, heartily with all your heart as unto the Lord, not unto men. So if you're a carpenter, if you're a bricklayer, if you're a plumber, whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord. Okay, he shall suffer loss. Uh, uh, second epistle of John. John says, take heed unto yourself, lest you lose those things which thou hast wrought. Stay with it. I'm going to get to an illustration momentarily. Stay with it. Lest you lose those things. I always think of Demas. Here, you know, Demas was traveling with Paul, ministering with Paul, I don't have any doubt whatsoever. Demas had a good relationship with the Lord, but all of a sudden, 
uh, he decided he wanted to go to Thessalonica and open a hardware store. There's no suggestion of apostasy in that man, no suggestion of his having forsaken the Lord. He just quit the ministry and, and uh, went to Thessalonica. I can't help but believe that whatever reward he had built up working with the Apostle Paul right there, he lost it. Now, that's lambology. Take it up if you would with the Lord. The, the second verse, uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Take heed unto yourself lest another man take your crown. I'll tell you, saints, the classic example of that is Saul and David. Saul had the crown. He was the anointed of the Lord. But when Saul decided he'd go into the God business and offer or priestly business, I should say, and offer sacrifices to the Lord, that ended it. And God took Saul's crown and gave it to a man after his own heart. David, David yes. Saul lost the crown, David got the crown. We'll come into more of that momentarily. So, there is that possibility of losing reward if I fail in faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 again, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, all of us want to be successful at whatever we do, but that isn't the bottom line. When you're dealing with the Lord and what you're doing in this earthly sojourn, faithfulness to Him is the key. Uh, I just want to throw out a few scriptures that address where we are right now while we're waiting on Him. We are doing that, aren't we? We're waiting on Him, we're looking for Him, and we're loving His appearing. Those are the three stages, really, of people. Hebrews 12, 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. That's as opposed to the mount that burned with fire and the thunders and the earthquakes. And it was so fearful, Moses said he was terrified. And the people said, don't talk with us. Don't let God talk with us. You talk with us. We can't stand the voice of God. But we haven't come to that mount. We've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Innumerable is right. A hundred thousand times a hundred thousand. <coughs> Thousands of thousands. <clears throat> to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. We are the church of the firstborn. He's the firstborn because he reproduced after his own kind. He's the only born, the only begotten because he's the covenant son. But he is the firstborn because he's reproducing after his own kind. Okay, we're the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. So when we come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, we get all this grand uh, gallery, if you would, of the redeemed, just men made perfect. But still, body's not translated because we're still here. Don't get their bodies to we. God having provided some better thing for us so that they without us, Paul said, could not be made perfect. They can't be made perfect until we come. We're all going to get it together. Wow. When I think of what some of them endured and what I have never endured, I think, my God's grace. Okay, so I'll get on with this. Uh, Hebrews eleven twenty six. This is Moses' attitude. 
He's kind of where we are. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures that are in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. There's nothing wrong with anticipating a reward. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and following, 1 and following, it kind of puts the responsibility before us. We should be a responsible people. Ooh, bunny path there. Uh, too much news lately. It gets You get that stuff in your head and what's going on in the world, and it clutters your thinking. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and following, Let a man so reckon us as the officers of Christ, again, New King James, and stewards of the secrets of God. By the way, the word steward and the word dispensation are the same word. It is a responsibility placed upon man. That's another subject. And as to the rest, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And to me, it is a very little thing uh, that by you I might be judged, or by man's day. Now, that's where we are now. We've been in man's day since Adam fell, and we will be in man's day until the translation of the church. And then the world is going to go into the day of the Lord while we're in presence of the Lord. So, nothing to me that I should be judged of you or man's day, but not even myself do I judge, Paul said. For I know nothing against myself, King James, to, my, to myself as I have a conscience, but not in this have I been declared right. Just because I feel good about myself, that doesn't mean everything's all right. Because he who discerns me is the Lord. So then, uh, judge nothing before the time until the Lord may come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then, I like the King James here better than the New King James, then shall every man have praise of God. Isn't that wonderful? God's going to have some good say about every believer. You are a great thorn in the flesh to Keith, brother. <laughs> you, you did your job well. Well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> All of us. The, the uh, New King James, I probably ought to uh, go ahead and read it. Uh, uh, then the praise still comes to each from God but hadn't changed anything. Now, the issue of reward. Uh, there's a lot of text here that I like to read. Uh, okay, go with me to Matthew 25. I'll do it. Matthew 25. I know we're going to eat today. Uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to develop a really good appetite. Matthew chapter 25. Now, this is a parable of the talents. We're going to contrast this in a moment with Luke 19, which is the parable of the minus. <clears throat> so, the kingdom of heaven, verse 14 20 of uh, Matthew 25. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country. Now, that's where Jesus is now. He's in a far country. Who called his own servants and delivered the, to, I'm sorry, and delivered to them his goods. And to the one gave he five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to each according to his own ability. God never gives us anything for which he has not equipped us. Very important. You know, the snake is always trying to get you to do something different than what you're doing. Uh, it's an uh, oversimplified illustration. If you're praying, He'll say, you ought to be out witnessing. If you're out witnessing, he'll say, you ought to be home studying the word. If you're home studying the word, he's saying, you ought to be praying. It doesn't make a difference what you're doing. 
It's never right with him. So every man according to his ability and immediately went on his journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And so with the man who had two until you come to the man that has one. Likewise, he who had received, I'm sorry, verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground. Uh, there's things that can be preached off of that. Hid his Lord's money after a long time. It has been a long time, hasn't it? I mean, we're waiting. Been a long time. The Lord of these servants came and settled his accounts with them. Here's the fire. And so he had, re he had received the five talents. Well, good and faithful servant, uh, you be ruler over five uh, cities. Uh, Verse 21, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your own. I'm really confused in parables there, but all right. Uh, he also who had received two. Um, Lord, look, your talent got two. He said, I have gained two more talents. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't have to get more than what he had. You will, uh, you've you been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things, enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he came to the guy that had the one talent. Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you had not reaped. And I was afraid and went, hid your talent in the ground. Look, here it is. What is yours? Give him back. What is yours? This Lord said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. Still a servant, but wicked and lazy. You knew that I reaped where I did not sow, gathered where I did not sow. You ought to have deposited my money in the bank and my at my coming I would have received back my own with interest interest. Therefore take from him. Remember? Take heed unto yourself, lest another man take your crown. Therefore take the talent from him. Give it to him that has ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given they might have abundance, and from him who does not have even that which he has will be taken away. But now catch this, and take the unprofitable servant and put him in outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and somebody always throws this guy in hell when that comes up. Outer darkness is not hell. Outer darkness is obscurity. And the weeping and the gnashing of teeth Oh, by the way, you remember Stephen stoning? Yes? You remember the scripture says that they ran at Stephen and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were not chewing on Stephen. That's a Hebrewism for regret, uh, for sorrow, for misery. It can be applied in a lot of ways, but it, it didn't go right the way I wanted it to go right. So there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're not in hell, they're in obscurity. Uh, did I give you a couple of verses for that? Psalm 88, verse 18. Uh, this is that grand prayer of the Lord Jesus too. Uh, it, I think it fulfilled... See it again in Hebrews 5, 7, in Jesus on the cross. Loved one and friend, you put far from me my acquaintance into darkness. Now, he had a lot of acquaintance out there that ran. You remember when he was arrested? They ran. 
Uh, Proverbs 20 and 20. Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out into deep darkness, outer darkness. Darkness is not hell, it is obscurity. As a matter of fact, you remember we've talked about Dr. Charles Barrow a lot, and he used to give me three by five cards with thoughts titled, typed on them, all of which I greatly appreciated. And he handed me one one time, and it said, the most welcome place in Sheehole would be a dark corner. <laughs> Some place to hide. They kind of no place to hide in Hades. All is naked and open with, before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All right, now go with me to Luke 19. Luke 19. Are we eating yet? Luke 19. Okay, they got this clock covered up here, so I don't see it. So uh, I am innocent in my ignorance. Uh, pick it up. Pick it up, verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now, take a view of this. What we read in 25 was very Jewish in its context. Matthew's a Jewish gospel. This is very Gentile. Luke, you remember the beloved physician, was a Greek doctor. And he was looking at the perspective from the Gentile point of view. And a lot of things in his gospel and wrote the book of Acts score that show up in the book of Acts. Okay, reading on, I'm sorry. So they thought the kingdom of God would immediately appear. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman uh, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom. That's where Jesus is now again. He's in a far country uh, waiting for his kingdom. So he called ten of his servants to live them ten minas and said to them, do business till I come. Be pragmatic, literally, till I come. But his citizens hated him, sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man reign over us. Do you hear that in the Pharisees? They sent him to the cross. We will not have, we have no king but Caesar. We will not have this man reign over us. Yes, no, wasn't that remarkable? That's a remarkable thing that the high priest prophesied of his death. And still, they blew it. They missed it. If they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, Paul said. Okay, verse 15. And so it was that when he re returned, having received the kingdom, I like the presupposition of that. The simplicity, he received the kingdom in spite of what these guys felt about it. So having come and received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him. <coughs> Sorry. Then he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. Said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, because you have been faithful in a very few things, have ruler over ten cities. You are, by the way, going to rule over things. You know that. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mind on which I have kept. Oh, I skipped one, didn't I? The second came saying, Master, your mind has earned five minus." Likewise also to him, ruler over five cities. Always according to your ability. Peter uses that same expression, according to gifts given to us according to our ability. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mind of which I have kept put away in a napkin. That Greek word, same thing, the cloth they wrapped Jesus in for what you might be interested in that. For I feared you because you are a hard man and you collect what you did not deposit, reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, wicked servant. Isn't that what he said in the other parable as well? 
wicked and unfaithful servant. Except this is Gentile. You knew that I was a hard man, collecting what I did not deposit, reaping where I did not. So why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by him, take the mina from him and give it to him that has ten. Take heed lest another man take thy crown. But they said to him, Master, he's got ten. Jesus said, But I say unto you, to every one who has will be given, to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now those two verses, 2 John 8, Revelation 3, 11, very important when you consider this. Now, verse 27, here's your great contrast between the believer, the wicked servant, the unfaithful servant, and the rest of them. Verse 27, bring here those my enemies who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Make the distinction between his enemies and his unfaithful servants. Their destinies are eternally apart. Okay, I'm going to close. What's the final reward of the saints? Revelation 20 and 6. Hey, we've read the end of the book, saints. We know how it comes out. <laughs> Satan notwithstanding, we know how it comes out. Revelation 20 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Now, the first resurrection has several parts. You want to take note of that. The church, uh, Old Testament saints, uh, you remember those that were raised from the dead when Jesus came out of the grave and never seen walking about Jerusalem? They're not in the church. That's the difference. That's a part of the remnant of redeemed Israel, a first fruit to him. That's another subject as well. So uh, the second, I'm sorry, the the first resurrection has many parts. You'll have the tribulation saints, ultimately. And even uh, the kingdom saints. Another subject. Over such the second death hath no power. Now, you know, if the Lord doesn't come, all of us are going to die. If he doesn't come first, hope he does come first. We're counting on it. Sure, Marge is counting on it. And I'm counting on Marge being right. <laughs> but he that liveth and believeth in him never die. I mean, you just kind of depart this thing you're in. I mean, it, it kind of falls off, and, and you depart this thing that you're in. In a twinkling of an eye, as fast as you can bat your eye. Wow. Finish the verse. Over that such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And back to chapter 5, and they shall reign on earth. I had a, I talking on the phone one time with a fellow who did not believe Jesus was going to come back to the earth, and I quoted that verse to him, and, and he said, well, now, it doesn't say on earth. Well, it did say on earth. And stupid me. I mean, I couldn't throw the verse at him. And I, probably good I didn't. I don't know. Anyway. Anyone have any questions? Comments? Question. Rebukes? Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it's kind of a euphemism for being faithful with the money. That's all. Do something with it that will reproduce. Uh, when you when you witness to somebody, you know, we have a feeling we've got. To, you know, I, I came out I came out of a school. You get a decision. <laughs> Witnessing, get a decision. No, you don't have to get a decision. One sows, another waters. God gives the increase. 
You're sowing the word of God. That's what you're called for. If they don't like what you're saying, you've sown the word of God. Leave it with God. The spirit of God redeems people, not you. So just leave it with the Lord. And bless the Lord. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Pardon? What's that security? Uh... Uh, you're not seen. You're you're out of the picture. Um, uh, let's see. It's like looking for a ship in the fog, and you can't see it for the fog because the fog is obscuring it. Does that help? Yes. Awesome. Anything else, mm-hmm. sir? Almost in the answer to that question. I, I was listening to one of your tapes from like 1981, <laughs> and you were talking about security <laughs> with the nation. And you made the analogy, and I thought this was kind of great, because the position that Israel has been in the world the last 2,000 years is just like that's right. their way up. That's the way those unfaithful nations will be in that day, just obscure, just out. No, they're not. Yes. It's just, they're there, but they're Nations, just, but they, they count for nothing. Count for nothing. Yeah. yeah. But I did have a question on <laughs> But I have the privilege of sitting with coffee tomorrow morning, so I'm going to throw a bunch of questions at them. <laughs> but one of the questions I had kind of pertaining, and it's been kind of gone going for this entire year, for me particularly, and um, that being Revelation 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Marvelous, yeah. glorious. I'm so grateful you've done this the last uh, several weeks. And I brought up the question, and I'd never really thought about it, I knew it, but between, like you mentioned, starting out here, Uh, between uh, Revelation 3 and 4, we go into the throne room, and you addressed that wonderfully here this morning. A lot happens before we actually get into the throne room. We watched the movie Before the Wrath. Sometime, are you going to maybe go into the wedding in the heavenly? Uh, Is that worth another meeting? There's a whole lot that happens. Yeah, wow. Before we get into the throne room, yeah, it's glorious. I don't, I don't want to get into Revelation six yet until well, we have a little bit more of that. Is that something? Yeah, that you think? I really you get the Revelation nineteen, and you can address that specific incident. Uh, it can be talked about before then that the marriage. Uh, I'm sorry, the the parable of the king that made a marriage for his son that's one of them that is very important and then the parable of the marriage feast that's another one now the marriage feast is on earth the marriage is in heaven that's for the family nobody else that's for the family it's private but the marriage feast is on earth and the public's invited to that remember the guy comes in without a wedding garment you don't get in heaven without a wedding garment you don't get in heaven without the right righteous robe. Uh, so it's an earthly scene. In fact, it's tied directly to the judgment of the nations. I guess that's where I was going. There's a, there's a distinction between a wedding and a wedding feast. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's what I come Yes, from. absolutely. Okay, well, maybe we should hit those parables in some time to come. All right, saints, anything else? All right, bless your heart, you're so patient. What's this thing say? It says 12 noon. <laughs> Isn't God good <laughs> to, to you? <laughs> All right, bless you. Father, you, we give thanks to you for the truth of your word. We depend on it, Lord. We lay ourselves upon the altar of your word. And Lord, <laughs> Even though you slay us, yet we'll trust you. So we're in your hands for whatever comes. And though hell and the snake raise his ugly head, you prevail. You have the victory. You bruised his head. That's the end of the matter. Bless your name. Amen. God bless you all.